Hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm going to be sharing some more gospel with you today. Thanks for joining me. And today we're going to be talking about, man, a very important matter, of course, faith. And what is perfect faith? And that is quite a question, I'm sure, for all you Christians out there. That's quite a, a bucketful to cover in just a few minutes here on one session. <laughs> so we will see how far we will go and get in this uh, lesson today. But basically, I will, and I will be sharing a lot from James, James chapter 2. Now, don't get scared. Don't get scared. Um, you know, for all of us grace, I'll say junkies out there, you know, for all of us who are absolutely established and immovable in the fact that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works, as it says in Ephesians 8 and 9, right? This chapter, this book of the Bible actually is is very can be challenging if we apply it as far as doctrinal faith in Christ and that is not actually the focus of James and that's why it can be challenging to try and uh, in a sense put a square peg in a round hole because James is a an applicable book of the Bible for practical Christianity, how we live our faith out. And when we understand that, when we understand that is the main focus of James, then it actually just, it just, it's so much easier to understand. And so I'll be going to some difficult verses that we, you know, you may or probably do already know about uh, faith and being perfect faith and what does that really mean in context. So again, this is a book that is meant for Christians who want to grow in their walk with God. It's not really um, most, I'll, I'll say baby Christians, that just want to simply make it to heaven and barely by this, you know, skin of their own teeth, you know, that they barely make it into heaven. They'll many times just skip over this book of the Bible because it's, it's, it's addressing whether or not we are living, you know, the Christ life. If we are letting Christ live within us rather than living our own lives and and not even having God anywhere, shape or form in our daily walk of life. So for those who want to have a productive faith and a, a working faith and not just walk around broke, busted and disgusted as Christians, this is a, a really good book to, to know and understand because if you're frustrated in your walk with God, this book of the Bible is very, very helpful. And it shouldn't be something to skip over. It's something to understand fully. So, so let's get into it. And before I do, I just want to emphasize again, and I'll be saying this several times, I'm sure, that I am not saying that this is these these verses that we'll be talking about, you know, having a completed faith and faith being perfected by works is how you get saved. This is not how you become a Christian. And actually, I suppose many unbelievers would, if they did read the Bible, <laughs> this would be one book of the Bible that they would just go to. This would be their favorite book of the Bible probably because it really focuses on hypocrites. <laughs> so, 
you know, this is um, definitely not one of those cotton candy kind of messages. So please don't just say, oh man, I hate eating vegetables. You know, <laughs> you know? I mean, if you want to grow, who doesn't want to, is there anybody out there who likes wearing poopy diapers? Anybody? You know, I mean, I hope you're a Christian who wants to grow and for your own benefit and for the benefit of others that you live with, right? I mean, it helps to understand how to walk with God and mature in grace and in and, and our walk of faith. It's, um, you know, some messages are meant to be helpful and they're not just all juicy fruit. You know, they're not, like I said, cotton candy kind of messages, but they will help you. They will help you because they will bring understanding that you need to know to have a successful Christian walk. And that's, that is one of these messages. So stay tuned and please stay through the whole thing. You know, don't get offended maybe halfway through it. I just want to encourage you on that because it, the, the application of this message in your daily life, uh, I'll especially be sharing at the end. So just stay tuned is my encouragement. You know, as, as Jesus said, don't get offended at the word because it's meant for you to grow thereby. You know, sometimes the word is a challenge if we are in any sense walking in the flesh, after the flesh, you know, and I don't know about all you folks out there, but we all, my, myself included, we can all grow in more and more grace and understand how to walk by faith in grace more and more so each day. So... I hope you do learn something good from this and, and grow in your walk with the Lord and, and achieve and, and manifest those things that you have been holding to in the word. You know, these wonderful promises that we have freely given to us in Christ, all freely given to us. They asked Jesus, what shall we do that we may work the works of God. So, you know, this is what every Christian wants to know. What do I have to do? You know, or anybody else for that matter. They want to know, how do I start walking in the kingdom of God? And it says, Jesus answered and said to them in John 6, 29, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent, period. So we can see right here that our salvation, our walk of faith is simply about believing and trusting in Jesus, period. It's not based on works, lest any man should boast, like I mentioned a moment ago. This, is, this, this message that we are going to be talking about in James is, is for your practical Christianity, your practical walk of faith so that you can enjoy these wonderful blessings that he's freely given us in Christ. And how do we receive those things? How do we walk those things out when we see these wonderful promises in the word? So let's go to John or James, sorry, of course, James 2 verse 14. It says here, and he is talking to, like I said earlier, many hypocrites. <laughs> That's the context, you know. That's the people that were preferring rich people in the church over poor, and you know they were just showing unfair preference to certain people, and just being the hypocrite, really, as you can see in this verse. Let's read it. What does it profit? And let me just pause right there. I know we're not getting very far so far, but 
let me just pause right there. You know, whenever God does anything or provides anything to us, faith, love, hope, creating the world, you know, in Isaiah 45, 18, I think it says that, you know, when he created the earth, he didn't create it in vain. He created it to be inhabited. So when he gave us the, this, I'll call it a tool, quote unquote, of faith and love for that matter, you know, just anything that God creates, it's to profit. It's to be a benefit. It's to be a blessing. It's it's to bring us from here to there. You know, it's active, it's living. You know, even the word, it says in Hebrews 4, 12, that the word of God is living. It's powerful, it's sharper. You know, it's full of life, the word. So likewise, faith is too. Faith is meant to profit a person. It's meant to profit the body of Christ. So if it doesn't seem like it's profiting or benefiting people, then in a nutshell, it's dead. And we'll be talking about that here in James. So let's go back to that. It says, what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one's one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So again, this James is talking about practical applications of faith what faith looks like. This is not doctrinal faith in Christ. This is talking about walking out your faith and what does it look like? And this section here is saying, you know, if you say somebody who's, you know, naked and, and needs help and is needs food and you do, all you say is pat them on the back and say, oh, well, I hope you have a lovely day, bye but you don't give them the things that they really need, well then your love, your love walk, your faith, because faith works by love. So if you don't have, and of course we understand that God, it says in Romans 5 verse 5, that God has shed abroad in your heart his love for you. You, in the spirit realm, you have an understanding, a, a reality of God's love shed abroad inside. That means inside, outside, from top to bottom. You are full of God's kind of love. The love that he has for you and the love that you can have for other people. And so when you say, oh, well, you know, just... I hope you're happy, Sally, even though you're sitting there on the curb and you know, you're know you broke, busted, and disgusted. Hope it works out better for you tomorrow, you know, but you don't do anything to help them. That's a sign that the love of God that you do have in your heart, you're not letting it live. You're not letting it out. Your faith is dead, like it says right there in James says, You're, you have faith, you say you have faith in verse 17, but if it does not have corresponding works, good works, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay, again, the emphasis is you will have corresponding action if you really believe in your heart what's true. It will just propel you. I'm not saying you must do this to be saved. I'm saying if you really believe it in your heart, there's going to be corresponding action. So just in the same kind of sense, if, if I 
you know, if I were somebody, if I were somebody sitting in a burning building and flames are coming up at the windows and I just say, I really believe, I really believe there's a fire in this building. You know, and then you see the smoke coming from underneath the door, or I do, you know, <laughs> the example's me. And I say, I really believe there's a fire in this building. And I just continue to sit there. You'd, you'd probably start scratching your head. Well, I guess, you know, they must not have all their marbles upstairs. Uh, they must not really believe or understand that there really is a fire. You know, by my actions, you can tell whether I whether or not I really believe that, right? Because if I believe, if I really understand and believe that there's a fire in the building, I'm going to be getting up and running out the building, <laughs> right? So that's the point being made here. It, this section here is not talking about how we receive our salvation. It's talking about walking it out, that there's corresponding action. And so he's being really, really sarcastic in this next verse. He's saying, you believe there's one God. Well, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. <laughs> you know, it's quite a sarcastic remark because he's just saying, you know, just the fact that you believe in God, that's not much. You know, even the demons believe in God, right? So he's kind of slapping. That's a slap, really. Um, <laughs> trying to wake him up, right? A cup of cold water in the face. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Oh my goodness. Here we go again. So you know, this is the one thing with uh, hardened hearts. You have to be be very blunt to the point and maybe even say the same thing several times so they get it and that's he's saying it again he said do you not and he said he calls them fools ouch 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 so you know if you don't have corresponding actions you say yes bless god i believe in god but you don't i mean if you don't even and I'm not saying we are saved by works, but I'm saying if your actions don't correspond to what you say you believe, then your faith is quite dead. You know, like I said earlier, God created faith to be alive. You know, what, what do things that are alive do? They grow, right? They move. They they. If they're alive, it's they're usually a blessing. You know, let's just say, uh, and we're going to get to it in a moment, but let's just say a corpse is in a casket, right? Well, are they, since they're dead, I mean, they're not really being a benefit to anybody, right? But a living person, uh, they're going about their day usually being a blessing some way or another. Uh, you know, parents, you know, you're taking care of your children, your faith is alive, so to say, right? I mean, you are active, you are living, you are doing something. So that's what I mean by your faith is alive. It's, it's, it's being, it's, it's showing forth with actions, right? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you not see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. People are like, slam on the brakes. Hold your horses. What do you mean? Abraham was perfected by his works. You know, his faith was perfect. See, and this is the message. This is what we're talking about today. And by works, by works, his faith was made perfect. Oh my gosh. You see how works really are important? 
Now, people say, listen, I know it says in the Bible somewhere that Abraham believed God and it, it, he just, it says he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, period. There was no works involved. And that's true. That's talking about your doctrinal faith in God. You know, that's talking about your salvation, how you receive Christ freely. It's, he came to you and he said, I have provided salvation by my blood freely, not based on anything you do. Will you receive it? Will you believe this truth? And you say, yes, I do. I trust in that truth. I believe in God that he came to save me, not based on anything I do. He did it for me freely. And that's what you call the, the doctrine. That's the faith righteousness. That's the doctrine of faith righteousness. However, in James, like we've been talking about, this is talking about how Abraham walked out his faith. How faith actually became perfect. And like I said, anything that we do in faith, you know, God created faith to be active, to be alive. And perfect there in that verse, by works, his faith was made perfect. It's indicating that your faith is designed to perfect you it's it's designed and when i mean that don't get me wrong i'm talking about when i say it meant to perfect you it's meant to deliver to you the fullness of the salvation that's freely given to you that's what i mean by perfect that word literally means complete faith was brought to its completion because abraham finally received fully everything that God had provided and it came by working together with his works. Let me show you here in the preceding chapter in James 1, 22. It says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So when we actually don't do and we don't we believe we read the word but we don't act on it that's how we deceive ourselves we actually get off of faith it, it, the track i could say the way of faith we we get it sidetracked we get off off on left field as it says there you deceive your own self i mean this isn't even the devil this is you you participate in deceiving yourself when you don't act on the word when the word says this is done this is provided for you freely now take it but you just sit back and say well i'm not sure god said that i'm not really sure that's true no i mean he says take it act on it and in a sense do it quote unquote so we want we want to see faith active and and see a work of faith in order to come to perfection to to have a a good outcome in our life and i believe it's james let's go to james 1 3. it says well actually two my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay, so you can see here, faith and patience are uh, linked up together. Faith works patience. Faith is definitely, if you, if you are going to inherit and walk in the promises of God, you will be allowing patience to work its work in your life also because as it says here in verse 4 but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing 
So I'm, this is sl a slightly a bunny trail, but the point is, is that similarly like patience, like just as patience has a work to do in your life that you may be perfect and complete because faith and patience are linked together, faith also has a perfect work to complete in your life. Doesn't, you know, it kind of, does that make sense? So it follows, they follow together, they're linked together. So if, because, even though this is talking literally about patience, because faith produces patience, and faith even says in the King James Version, your faith works patience, okay? I'm in the New King James Version over here. So the fact that patience and faith are working together, you could say also that faith, faith needs to have a perfect work in order that you would be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, okay? So my point is, is that Faith, when it, when it produces effortlessly a work to do in your heart, you know, you're like, uh, let's just go back to the building on fire example, <laughs> you know, I mean, if I truly do, I've, I've now gotten to the point where I've convinced my heart, I've convinced my heart that, oh my gosh, the building really is on fire. So it, I actually have a work of faith in my heart that produces a, a natural work in my body to move on. You know, I'm gonna get up out of the chair, I'm gonna run out the building. It's, it's producing a work that literally is saving my life. So just like patience is meant to make you perfect and complete so you lack nothing. You know, it says in Hebrews 6, 12, that it's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises. So to see how they work together. So if I am allowing faith to work in my heart, you know, to convince my heart of the truth, so much so that it produces uh, an actual action in my life, then you could say faith is alive. Faith isn't dead. It's actually producing corresponding action that will bring me to fullness, an actual manifested fullness in, of Christ in my life. You know, I will actually experience the fullness of Christ rather than just saying it. I'm actually then beginning to experience Christ manifested in my life, if it's then producing actions throughout my body by being so fully convinced in my heart first. Does that help? I hope that's clear. So this is, this is, I guess you could say, this is like the mechanics of walking out your faith in Christ, right? So, Let's go on to the next verse here, verse 20, whew, I guess we stopped in 23. Okay, yeah, so we see that a man, or I'm sorry, uh, did we say 23? I guess we haven't even said 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's saying it again. You know, another, another, whoo, man, that'll, that's like a, another cup of cold water, another cup of cold water right there. 
You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. I'm going to say that three times. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Wow. You know, this is the kind of thing that when Martin Luther, you know, he was so enlightened as we, I hope you all and myself are, we are so enlightened with grace and the freedom that we have in Christ, that it's not, our, our relationship with God is not based on the outward works that we do. God's love for us and his acceptance and great favor that he has toward us is not based on works. It's not based on our good behavior. It's based on what Jesus, has did, Jesus did for us on the cross. His good works right so when we read verses like that my point is what i was about to say is when martin luther read that verse or these verses in james he said whoa 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 whoa, whoa. we're not going to include james in the canonized bible <laughs> this, this is this is sacrilege this is blasphemy you know you're talking about you're talking about works in order to be justified i don't think so you know but the point is is again this book of the bible is talking about practical christianity this is not talking about doctrinal entering the kingdom of god this is talking about what does faith look like what does perfect faith look like you know it's 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 it actually complements what paul said in romans about faith that it's not of works lest any man should boast you know that is the doctrinal faith whereas on the other flip side of the coin of faith as it says here in james True faith is, is partnered with works, good works, I should say. And this is where we want to distinguish good works from works of the law. This is a huge eye-opener for many people because they think they, they can read James and they think that I have to do these works I need to be good to my, I need to be good to my neighbor or else I'm not saved. I don't have faith. My faith is dead. I don't have a relationship with God if I don't do this. No, I'm not saying that at all. And that's how many Christians read James and they get so confused. They're like, I don't get it because I'm reading in Romans and I'm reading in Ephesians and many, all the other books of the Bible, many other verses in the gospels that say, I am not saved by my personal works. So how do I reconcile this difficult verse in the eyes in the light of the gospel? Well, we, in context, see, that's how it helps to read it in context. In context, it's talking about your personal walk, your walk of faith. It's talking about your, literally your, how faith is alive, how it shows signs of being alive in your life. It's not talking about how you enter the kingdom of God. It's talking about how you walk out here in this earth realm with other people, with other people, the body of Christ and, and your neighbors, any, anybody. This is how you walk it out. And it's with corresponding works, associated works, right? Just like as an example, you know, it says if we don't, if we don't breathe air, we're dead, right? We need air to live. So is it air alone that saves us? Is it air alone that saves you? I mean, we do need air. But 
actually it's a partnership you can say it's having the air and then also you breathing the air that you actually are alive if you're not breathing if there's no air or if you're not breathing then you're dead right but you need both of them to be living in the same sense for your faith to be living it needs corresponding action if you don't have the corresponding action then it's dead it's inactive it's incomplete it's incomplete so don't get uh, also don't get you know feeling condemned or judged it's just uh this is a correction this book of james is a correction for people and i'm not saying you are i'm just in context it's t it's talking to a bunch of hypocrites <laughs> you know but it's also teaching us how we can have effective faith and what are the signs of effective working faith the signs are it acts faith acts it has works associated with it and like i was saying a couple minutes ago there's two different types of works one is the work of faith it's it's a, a living alive it's propelled and energized by the holy spirit it's something that happens effortlessly because it's not you it's faith being convinced of the truth in your heart that propels you to effortless action because it's God living his life out through you. Now that's the work of faith. That's the good work of faith. Whereas a dead work, or you could say a work of the law, that's what you call it literally in the Bible that calls it a dead work. And that's where people try and do actions and say, oh, well, I gotta prove that, I gotta prove that I am a Christian. I gotta do this. I gotta do this. And they got their long list of to do, do this, do this, don't do this. Those are dead works because you're trying to earn your salvation by your own efforts. And that's not what I'm talking about here. That's not what's trying to be communicated here. This in context is talking about knowing whether or not you truly believe in your heart by what are your outward actions you know do you have good actions or do you have stinky actions <laughs> right so they work together they work together to bring you to full completion you know to inherit the fullness of the gospel just like i was saying with the example of breathing you can't just have faith with nothing corresponding you know you can't just have air and then not breathe it you want to breathe you know put action and breathe the air so you can remain alive right i mean look at a corpse again you know if, if the corpse the corpse has air but are they alive no, they're dead because they're not breathing the air. So that's how faith is alive. It has corresponding action. This is perfect faith, as we read in the preceding verse here. It says in verse, the thing, verse 22, Do you see that faith was working together? It's a cooperation you know it's it's linked together inseparable when it's true faith when it's true operational faith it's inseparable from corresponding works and by works faith was made perfect in other words as i said in james 1 verse 4 speaking of patience faith brought perfection or completion to that person they fully inherited the promises you know we do grow in um levels of faith believe it or not i mean similarly even as it says in galatians 4 verse 19 
You know, Paul said, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. But he's talking to Christians in Galatians. He's talking to people who are already Christians. So you can see similarly in that example that they hadn't yet been fully persuaded of their identity in Christ. They were still yet babes, so to say, in Christ. Even though they were children to God, but they, had, they hadn't yet fully formed. You know, Christ had not really been fully, um, I don't want to say fully received, but their actions were, if you read in context, their actions in, were very poor. So it was indicating that their faith had not yet been perfected, that their, their pers heart had not yet been fully persuaded of the gospel. I mean, fully. You can have levels of faith. You can be in faith and in doubt at the same time. It does happen. Uh, that may be an eye-opener for many. People think, well, you're either in faith or you're in doubt, but there's no mixture. Oh, no. <laughs> there is definitely opportunity to have both at the same time. You know, I mean, as an example, when Jesus called Peter out under the water and so he had faith. You know, he came out walking on the water with Jesus and then he began to sink. And Jesus said, oh, you, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So you can see right there that, you know, Peter had faith, but he was doubting too. So you could say, in a sense, his faith was not perfected. It was not fully persuaded. He's, he actually got off track on his faith because he started looking not at Jesus. See, this is the key. Not at Jesus, focused only on Jesus, but he was focused. It says he looked around and at the waves and the, the you know, the sounds at the, the surroundings. He got distracted and fearful and started to sink. So that's how your faith can become weakened is you're focused on the natural things and not on Jesus and the gospel. Simply put. Simply put. So if you want to enjoy the perfection of your, you know, perfect faith, uh, similarly, as I said, and again, I want to go back there to James 1, 4. It says, let patience have its perfect work. You know, let faith work in your heart so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let works come forth in your life that are corresponding to the faith that's in your heart in order that you would be saved, spirit, soul, and body, and in relationships, and in finance, every finances, every area of your life. God wants you abundantly blessed but the only way to see those things come to fruition is to be so fully convinced in your heart having perfected faith no, no doubting no wavering that it brings forth effortless good works of faith in your life so that you are perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And of course, again, this is the practical application of faith. This is not, uh, it's already completed in the spirit realm. That's the truth. You, have, you already have every single good thing in Christ freely provided you by him, not by your own works. But if you want to see those things manifest in your life, then it takes a cooperation. It takes you applying those truths by walking them out. Let me show you an example. Let's go to <laughs> the famous story that so many people love, David and Goliath. 
1 Samuel 17, 46. Let's start there. It says, this is David. He was so fully convinced in his heart, as it says here, he was so fully convinced that he says, this day, he says to Goliath, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that they may know that the Lord, that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will, he will give you into our hands. That's verse 47. <laughs> so let's just pause right there. Okay, here's David, and he is so, he is charged, he is so fully persuaded that he has the covenant with God. He is God's beloved. And he, 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 little, little guy, and he's charging at this, this huge giant over nine feet tall. And he's saying, God is going to deliver you into my hand and, and I'm going to take your head off. <laughs> I'm going to kill you is what he's saying. And he said, God will do this. So let's see what happens next. And then David pulled out a chair and sat down and waited on God. Oops. Does it say that? No, it didn't say that, did it? Of course not. No. So you see, I mean, even in David's faith here, David acted on his faith as we see next. He said it and then, and he first, let me just say, first he was so fully convinced of his covenant with God, that God had his back, that God always gives him the victory, just like us, that he, he charged at the enemy and he said, God has given you to us today and I will decapitate you in a moment so that all will know that there is a God in Israel. And it doesn't say he just sat back then and waited on God and didn't do anything, right? No, it says here in the next verse, So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened, I like it, and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So he didn't draw back and say, Oh no, let's run for your life, run for your life. No, he didn't run in the opposite direction. He charged. He, he ran toward the problem. He wasn't intimidated at those false, you could say false circumstances that were opposite of what he just declared. He will give you into our hands. That's what David said. He will give you into our hands. So that's where many Christians stop. They just say, oh, praise God, I've been delivered. And that's true. God has given the enemy into our hands, so to say. You know, to, he, he's been defeated. And so people just then sit back and wait. But are you so fully convinced, like David was, to charge at the enemy, to hasten and run toward the enemy? It says, then David, see, he's acting. He's acting on his faith. He's producing works of, this is a work of faith. This isn't a work of the law. Oh, I better do this or else God's not happy with me. No, he's not trying to earn his salvation. He's actually convinced of his salvation. And so he has corresponding action. His, his faith is alive. And I'm not, you know, he, he's actually acting and running toward the enemy. He's not intimidated. He's not fearful. He's fully persuaded in faith. Because if he had any doubt whatsoever of his faith, in his faith, in God, he would have been running the other way. Because this was a very intimidating um, experience, to say the least. 
you know so he he didn't run away he ran toward the problem so so let's see what he does he said he said David put his hand in his bag took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth and so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword. Did David stop there? You know, if you get a little bit of a victory, don't just stop. Continue to the completion, right? Get the full manifestation of your salvation, right? So there was no sword, as it says here, verse 50 in the hand of David. Therefore, check this out, David continues. He, he runs and stands over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead and they fled. Is that not a real application of resist the enemy and he will flee from you, right? James 4, 7. So in the same sense, in a, in a real applicable situation, in the light of the gospel, let's just say, let's just say you were having financial troubles maybe, you know, and, and we see all these promises that say, you know, he will, as it says in Philippians 4, 19, it's according to his riches in glory that he will meet all your needs you know god has abundantly provided you to be a blessing in every good work let me go there that's a great verse second corinthians 8 9 talking about working out your faith with works right i'm sorry let's go to nine it's nine eight sorry second corinthians nine eight it says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you, having, sufficient, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for what? Oh, look at that. It's the W word. <laughs> may have an abundance for every good work. So, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, I would love to give to that ministry, but I just, it just doesn't fit my budget. You know, well, this says, this says that you have been abundantly blessed so that you would have an abundance for every good work. So get cheerfully. Don't worry about what, what the bank account is communicating to you. You know, that's where you resist. That's where you charge at the enemy. You know, the enemy that says, you don't have enough. Nah. The word says, yeah, you're abundantly supplied, but no, I don't think you are. That, see, that's Goliath speaking to you. And you want to charge at that with a resistant work that corresponds with your fully persuaded faith. That shows that your faith is alive. Now, I'm not saying... You give to prove that you have faith because that would just be a work. That would just be a work. Now we're talking about a work of faith. A work of faith means you're first fully convinced in your heart and then you just, it's like you can't help it but act on it. It's an effortless action because it's propelled by true faith in your heart by the Holy Spirit who's acting out through you. Because it says we don't, it's not us who lives, it's Christ who lives in us, Galatians 2.20. If it's not you trying to live that supernatural life by your own effort, that, that will bring sweat and tears. You'll be crying when you write that check, you know? <laughs> you know, when it's by the flesh, when it's by your own action. But when it's a work of faith, you're giving cheerfully. You're like, praise God, I can't wait to give this because I am so blessed. I am so, God knows he will 
He has blessed me with everything that I need abundantly, so I have an abundance for every good work. And see, it's a work. Notice that in that verse. It's a work. It's a work of faith. So that's how you resist, just like David did in that example. You charge at the enemy with corresponding resistant uh, you know resisting action you you push back on that doubt that contradicts the word circumstances that that are opposing the truth of the gospel see so here's another example here let's go to Luke 6 10 Okay, so here's a man with a withered hand in Jesus' um, vicinity in, in the synagogue. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so Jesus says, he looks around, and he says to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. Stretch it out. So what did what the, the guy do? Let's just pause right here. What's he doing? <clears throat> Does he say, oh, well, I can't. I got a withered hand. No, he doesn't say that. He believe apparently he believes the word. He believes it. He says, "Ooh, you know, I have faith. I believe Jesus. He never lies. He's walking around healing everybody. He is filled with the power of God. You know, this man apparently had an understanding and believed in the power that Jesus was working at walking in." He, he probably had heard about all the miracles that G Jesus had been doing. He, he had faith in Jesus and his word. So because he so fully, note that, fully, or you could say perfected. He had such perfected faith that he acted on it. He didn't say, he didn't draw back and say, oh, no, I can't do that. See, see my withered hand? I can't do that. You know? No. It says right there, the next section. He said, and he did so. Bam. He did it. His hand was restored as whole as the other. Just like that. The supernatural and the blink of an eye. Isn't that exciting? See, you already have it. You already have the healing. You already have the blessing. You already have his high favor and his his love, he never draws away from you. You are abundantly blessed with every good thing. There's nothing that he would withhold. It's, it's, it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He, he, these, thing, these promises are unconditional. And it's when we get fully convinced, or you could say have perfected faith. We're fully convinced in our heart that we will actually act on that word and that word that that action is our is our handshake we're actually agreeing with jesus and coming into partnership with the living word and that living word is working through that action and producing the manifested glory of god manifested glory See how it says it says here in Mark 16 20. It's a partnership. You know, God told him to go out and share the gospel. And it says in Mark 16 20. So they went out and preached everywhere. So they're partnering with God. They're sharing the word. And it says the Lord worked with them. And how? confirming the word through accompanying signs so when you are believing the word and acting on it you are partnering with god and it's his his power is producing the miraculous result in your life it's a partnership because if 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 it were just all up to God, then everybody would be saved. Everybody. But God doesn't force himself upon anybody. It says his eyes are roaming to and fro. He doesn't want to miss out on anybody that's believing on him. He is always like 
white on rice, as they say here on the set in the South, you know, I mean, if, if you are believing his word and, and, and it's producing action in your life, you're acting on it. He is right there confirming that word with, with awesome signs and miracles following. Isn't that exciting? It's so exciting. You know, so another example is, now this is talking about real applications of our faith. In John 5, 8, this is the man who was paralyzed, staying for, I think it was 38 years by the pool of Bethesda. And so Jesus, you know, he came up to him. He said, do you want to be made well? And he, he said, ah, oh, well, I have no one here to carry me to the pool. But Jesus said in verse eight, he says, rise up. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. So what, what do you think the man did? First time he ever saw Jesus, probably. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jesus gives him the command. He says, rise up, get up, pick up your bed and walk. Well, does he draw back and say, well, no, I've been here. It's been 38 years. There's no way I could do that. So, no, he had corresponding action. He believed the word. And so consequently, it benefited him. When he fully believed the word, it had, he had perfect faith, fully persuaded faith. And in verse 9, it says, Immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. Praise God. It's just, it's just so simple. It's the, the fact that we want to fully pers allow our hearts to be fully persuaded so that we can act on the word that's already on the promise that's already given us. We already have these promises that are ours. He, Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So he still does that today. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And he's just looking for people that would believe it, fully have fully persuaded faith, and just get up and go. Just believe it. Just go. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. And you know what? We, we never did finish James. Let's go back to James. James 2, let's go to verse 25. This is a good example because a lot of people will read chapter 2 and, you know, they'll read chapter 2 and they'll try and you know, like I said earlier, put a square, try and put a square peg in a round hole and, you know, say it's, oh, this is all talking about my, my righteousness, my justification before God. My faith has to be made perfect by my actions. Well, you see, this next example just totally nullifies that wrong dogma, you know, this, this misunderstanding and twisting of the scripture. That is not what this section is about. It's about practical Christianity and how to walk out our faith. And as it says here in verse 25, likewise was not Rahab the harlot. Whoa. Are we talking about Mother Teresa here? No, we're talking about a harlot. Okay. Does this sound like somebody who's justified by their faith, by their work? You know, no, this is a prostitute, okay? And yet it says, Rahab the harlot was justified by her works. What? <laughs> See what I'm saying? This is not talking about, you know, your holy works or your prayers for many hours or all your church attendance and your Bible reading, you know, those things are good. But this book of the Bible is talking about living out your Christianity and it has corresponding action. And here it's not talking about a holy action, is it? 
Because if it did, it would have said, and she quit being a prostitute. No, it's talking about literally Rahab when the spies came and she hid the spies to save her own neck. She literally, it says here, she received the messengers and sent them out another way. You know what she did? She actually lied. So how could this be a, a work of righteousness? No, this is talking about a, believe it or not, a work of faith. It's not talking about holy actions. It's talking about what did she do? You know, what did, what did she do to indicate that she fully believed in Yahweh God? You know, the God of the Israelites. Well, you know what she did? She actually lied and hid the, the spies in her own house. And she said, I believe in your God. And they're like, really? Well, here, you know, hang a red cord out of your window when we come and we'll save you. And guess what? She was saved. That was her quote unquote work of faith. Yet she lied and she was a prostitute. So, you know, this does not apply to how we enter the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. This is talking, this again, is talking about how to have perfect faith or an indicator, I should say. And how, <laughs> how to have perfect faith. How to, it's in the preceding chapter. I mentioned it earlier. It's James 1, 22. It says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So this is how you, you know, walk out your faith and, and grow in fully developing your faith. It's by acting on the word. When you read it, don't just disregard it and say, well, that's too difficult or or you know, come up with some circumstances in your life that contradict that word and lean on the circumstances instead of trusting in the word. No, trust the word and act on it. And, and thereby avoid deceiving yourself and thereby keeping, allowing your faith to remain alive and active, not dead, right? Praise God. I mean, you want to enjoy these wonderful promises that are ours. And, and just as David did, the way you do it is meditate. You know, in case, I hope, man, if you've in, listened this long, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you haven't gotten offended at the word. And it, you may be asking, well, you know, my actions really don't line up with the word. You know, I mean, I really... I want to do these things. I want to walk it out like you're saying, Amanda, but how, how do I do that without it becoming a dead work or a work of the flesh? So the way we do that is we can, if it says faith in he, uh, Romans 10, 17, it says faith comes by the hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So we continue, just continue in the word. You just continue. And when I say continue, I'm not saying just dabble in it, you know, just once a week or five minutes a day. You know, no, it says incline your ear to the word. Keep it in the midst of your heart. In other words, throughout the day, meditate and think on these wonderful promises and assure your heart continually of the truth and cling to them and and disregard symptoms or circumstances that contradict these truths you know cast it says cast down it's an active resistance like david did you know it says in second corinthians 10 you cast down these thoughts that contradict the the reality of Christ and what he's accomplished for us on the cross. So if you hear lies and 
false symptoms and bad reports. No, cast those things down at the same time that you are holding to the truth and do that regularly. Abide, like it says, abide in the truth. That's a daily thing. Kind of like you would eat food daily. You know, you don't just eat once a week, right? Man, you'd be starving. But no, you eat the gospel regularly and abide in it. And you will at, at some point fully convince your heart by the truth, by abiding in it, by basking in his love for you. Because like I said earlier, faith works by love. So it's not just the word, the word, the word, the word, but you want to be specifically, definitely focused on his unconditional love for you, that it's not based on your works. It's not based on your personal righteousness, your personal goodness, your good behavior, your inheritance and, and all these many blessings are freely given in Christ. And it's this word of the gospel that you want to focus on and assure your heart in regularly and not get into works of the law. Because it says here in Galatians 5, 4, that you, you want to avoid becoming estranged from Christ, right? It says you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. So make sure that the word that you're abiding in is, is all about his unconditional favor for you, not bound up in works of the law and your good behavior and, oh, I better be a good little Christian or else God's never going to come through for me. No, it's, that's what you call being works minded. And ironically, that's not the works we're talking about here. These are works of faith that are just a result of living faith, not dead faith, but living faith in your heart that's become fully persuaded. Just like if I had a seed and I planted it in the dirt over there, but it never grew. It never produced roots and never pushed through the ground and through those rocks. You know, the faith shows forth a resistance against what's opposing it. It acts against those things and it continues to, it grows, it's living. Faith is living and eventually that seed would produce fruit, right? Something, a blessing, something that's, like, like it said there in James 2, in context of um, clothing for somebody's back and food for their belly, you know? I mean, faith actually is a blessing. It's, it produces a blessing is what I'm saying. So, but if I were to say the seed, just I planted it, but nothing's coming up. Well, when you say that seed is dead, yeah, right? It's not doing anything. It's not helping anybody. It's not producing fruit. It's, it's dead. Or you could say it's, it's been corrupted maybe. You know, that's, that's what I was talking about before. You can have faith that's corrupted. It's, it's your, your little tiny mustard seed of faith has been corrupted with tons of doubt. <laughs> so it, it can't produce the corresponding actions if you're just so immersed in many doubts and worries and concerns instead of casting those things down you're actually you're actually meditating and thinking on those things imagining what would happen if fill in the blank dreaming those horrible things you know instead of focused on the word and these promises that can bring peace to your heart and confidence in your God so that you just go forth and just don't disregard anything else. doesn't matter. My God says, fill in the blank. I got the victory. doesn't matter what blah, 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 blah says. Newspaper here says or what my doctor, my banker, you know, whatever. 
all these other people say it doesn't matter my god says this so stand firm in your faith and and resist those circumstances show show that you do you know be convinced of course first in your heart and don't don't draw back but act on that word and and, and see the manifested fruit that brings you to lacking no good thing, right? Praise God. Well, I hope you enjoy this as much as I have. <laughs> I'm glad you've joined me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And, and you all have a wonderful week. And I look forward to sharing with you again next time. Bye-bye.